Okay, so we just finished with example, uh, what was it, example two, part B, and we're going to take a look now at what can actually be said about this next definition. So here's what I have. The Jacobian of a transformation, T, and that's, suppose that transformation is given by the following, right? So again, it takes an EUV, it spits out an X and a Y. The Jacobian of that transformation is given as the following. It's defined using notation that looks like this, but ultimately comes out equal to a determinant of a two by two matrix. Now, again, this can look a little bit strange at first, but we'll talk about why it comes out like this and uh, what exactly this is used for. How, some good ways to try to remember it. If I'm going to be going ahead and doing a two by two determinant, then uh, remember this is very similar to doing a cross product, like, uh, or at least finding a, one particular component of a cross product, once you've kind of eliminated a row and a column. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go across this diagonal and I'm going to multiply these two values together. And then, of course, I will subtract when I go across the other diagonal. So I get something that looks like this. Okay. Of course, this is assuming, as I state below, that these partial derivatives exist. Now, a reason for why exactly we're going to get here uh, is not exactly uh, expressed uh, in the notes here. But as I state in the note below, um, if you want an exploration kind of helping to explain the, this particular idea um, and, and where exactly some of this is coming from, uh, you, you can go ahead and take a look at the notes and the justification in Blackboard. We're going to see here that intuitively, as I describe in this last note, this idea of the Jacobian is going to ultimately be kind of like a area correction factor for when I make this change of variables. I always think about it in my mind like the following idea related to a U substitution. Let's suppose in a Calc 1 class I was doing a U substitution where I was going to replace all of my X squareds with a U. Well, I know that I also am going to have to replace my DU with a DX, but I don't only replace it with a DX. In this case, I would have to say that du is equal to 2x dx. And this is kind of the idea of the Jacobian. This 2x piece is kind of this correction factor that helps the substitution actually work out correctly. But the Jacobian here is then something that I can easily go ahead and attempt to compute um, based on this uh, 2 by 2 determinant. Okay. So that's kind of what the Jacobian's purpose is. It's kind of playing the role, if you will, of this 2x formula when we did like a classic U substitution. Now, memorizing this sort of a formula up here can be a bit intimidating at first, but I always like to think about it in the following way. I can kind of think about the top row up there as operating like the gradient of the x function. So it's kind of like partial with respect to u, partial with respect to v. And then the next row can be considered as like, well, the gradient of the y function. And that at least helps me to remember where everything goes, at least in the initial setup. And then the calculation after the fact is fairly simple. So take a look down here at example three, and you'll see kind of how this works. Let's suppose I want to find the Jacobian of this transformation. Now here I didn't use u's and v's. I used r's and thetas, but it doesn't really make any difference. Let's go ahead and see what we actually have. I still know that this thing here is supposed to produce an X, and this is supposed to produce a Y. So if I have this transformation, how would I calculate the Jacobian? So I would do this. I would say, we calculate, and here's my notation, and I'm going to set up that determinant. So remember that the top row is going to kind of be like the gradient of x. And I'm going to start with doing derivative with respect to r and then derivative with respect to theta. So if I take a look at x and I do the derivative with respect to r, I should get just regular cosine theta. If I do derivative with respect to theta, I'm going to get 
negative r sine theta. If I do the same exact thing with the y component, I'm going to end up with sine theta when I do derivative with respect to r, and I'm going to end up with r cosine theta for that other component. And now what I have to do is to actually go ahead and take a look here at uh, this 2 by 2 determinant. So again, I'm going to go ahead and take my first two components on the diagonal here. I'm going to take my r cosine theta multiplied by my other cosine is going to get me a cosine squared. Again, multiplying these values together. Then I'm going to subtract what happens by the others. Notice though that I am multiplying or uh, subtracting a negative, so I'm going to have a positive r sine squared theta. Of course, I can simplify this down, right, by factoring out the r, and then I'm left with a cosine squared theta plus a sine squared theta, and I see that, well, ultimately, that's just the value of r. So this would be a Jacobian, and this is actually a really powerful time to relate back to something that we have already seen. You might recall at the beginning of this section, we talked about that we already did a change of variables when we talked about changing to polar coordinates. And remember that the Jacobian is supposed to kind of act like this extra little piece that I need to have when I swap my differentials. So when I go all the way back to the beginning of this section, you might recall that when we did a transformation where I swapped in stuff to change to polar, I changed over my function, I changed over my bounds, I changed over the differentials from dx dy to dr d theta, but I also had to include, and there it is, the Jacobian. Um, that's that little correction factor that I needed, and it appears right there in the integral. Okay? And that's exactly what we're seeing right down here. We've calculated, yes, that is the thing we would need if we want to change x's into r cosine thetas and y's into r sine theta. So this right here is the polar transformation. All right, in the next video, we're going to go ahead and generalize this idea and then try to see how we can apply it to a very, very specific uh, problem that will work all the way through, kind of like a full substitution.